Hello, my name is Douglas Wynn, and welcome to the fifth and final installment in my ongoing series of interviews with the authors of Limbus Inc., a shared universe anthology from Journalstone Publishing. My guest today is Jonathan Mayberry, best-selling, award-winning author of the Joe Ledger series, the Pine Deep trilogy, a new zombie YA series, which was kicked off in 2010 with Rot and Ruin. Jonathan has written for Marvel Comics. He's written nonfiction, novels, short stories, and now his novella, Strip Search, featuring the werewolf P.I. Sam Hunter, appears in Limbus, Inc. Thanks so much for joining me today, Jonathan. My pleasure. So uh, your story in Limbus, Strip Search, is my favorite in the book. It's a great book with a lot of excellent stories, but uh, it's, it's, uh, there's so much to like in Strip Search, which takes this uh, detective noir vibe and, uh, and puts it into the context of a werewolf story, which is just fantastic. So uh, first of all, how did you become involved in the Limbus project? Uh, what, actually, what attracted you? Yeah, they, they reached out to me for Limbus um, uh, over a year ago, and uh, at first I, I said I couldn't do it. I, I was you know, enormously busy and, and kept kind of dodging it because I didn't want to do it, uh, not because of the project, just I was so busy. But then they told me more about the project and how much creative freedom I'd have with it, and I, I, they, they finally sold me on it, so I had to jump in. Um, but it, it's just so much fun. It, it, it leaves it, every door open for you to tell a story, and yet it's still a shared world, which is an unusual combination. I don't think I've seen anything quite um, structured like that. It really is a unique take on a shared world. Um, in, in the case of your story, uh, I got a real sense of, of a, a Maltese Falcon kind of character, and yet he's he's in a very modern context, and there's a great sense of humor in there. Uh, was there were you thinking of particular uh, crime fiction authors or or film noir uh, influences when when you took on uh, Sam Hunter? Well, this is actually the second Sam Hunter story. Uh, I introduced him originally in a, in a, a short, much shorter story um, called uh, "Like Part of the Family." And I had always wanted to write a noir story. I, I've read probably all the noir that's out there. You know, I you know, started with with Philip Marlowe, and um, you know everything Dashiell Hammett did, and and you know just all of it. I've always liked kind of the smartest here, the the, uh, the Spencer, um, uh, a lot of the uh, the Elvis Cole novels by by Robert Crace. You know, anything where, where the character is smart, savvy but has a sense of humor. I always like those, and usually those characters, are, uh, the humor is somewhat defensive because they, they have some emotional or psychological damage, and that's always fun to explore. Uh, Jim Rockford was, was a, I believe, not an influence, uh, a character from TV shows back in the, the, the I think, the 80s, uh, the 70s and 80s, who was kind of a down-on-his-luck sort of private eye, but he was the moral center of the story, but not necessarily always moral. Uh -huh. So I, I had all of those as influences when I when I was putting together Sam Hunter, and his personal sense of humor just kind of grew out of out of my own smart ass sensibilities. <laughs> yeah, he's a fun guy to spend some time with, and and I like how you know we have him reflecting on uh, going to a strip club, and and you get a real sense of of him just being a good guy, but uh, but he's he's also certainly got a, an edge and. Uh, in, in that regard, he reminded me of, of one of your other characters, of course, Joe Ledger, uh, your, your famous agent in your ongoing series. Um, now, I, I read on Facebook that you said you're going to be bringing Joe Ledger and Sam Hunter, the werewolf uh, detective, into a story together. Uh, I've, I've got to know about this face-off because they're both no-bullshit guys. Are, are they... Are they? Uh, I know you probably don't want to spill much, but allies or, uh, or enemies, uh, I, where, where and when might we see them? Yeah, well, that that'll be in Limbus too. That'll be the the second Limbus anthology, and it, the story is the working title. of The story is two guys walk into a bar, and um, okay. it's told from Sam Hunter's point of view because it's a Sam Hunter story. But he does encounter uh, Joe Ledger, and they're similar in in some regards in that they're they're tougher than the average guy. They're they're um, uh, both smart asses, both with skewed worldviews. Uh, but they do come at it from different points of view. I mean, Joe is part of a, of a military organization that goes after people using weird science, and Sam Hunter is definitely a fringe character in the supernatural world. Um, Joe may not be as aware of the supernatural elements of the story that he's in. Uh, he, he, you know, he's always looking for the scientific explanation for something. Okay. But um, and I, I, 
I haven't written the story yet. I've got, I've got to plot it out. There is a lot of, of uh, budding heads going on between the two of them. There's also a third character that, that I have from another series, um, uh, Mike Sweeney, actually two characters, Mike Sweeney and Malcolm Crow from my Pine Deep novels. So the story is actually set in Pine Deep with these two characters. So it's really three of my, my major character groups colliding in one very violent story um, <laughs> set, in, uh, set in Pine Deep. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. It's great to know that we're going to be seeing uh, more of you in, in the next volume of Limbus. And, uh, and everybody at Journal Stone, you know, the, the small press that, that I work with, we're all so excited to, to have you on board. Uh, I know that you've got uh, hardcover editions of the Pine Deep books coming up with Journal Stone and also a collection of Joe Ledger stories. Right. I wanted to just briefly touch on that. Um, will we be seeing things that span Joe's career? Might there be anything in there um, pre-patient zero? Uh, what, what's some of what we might expect in, in the uh, well, collection? The, there's nothing actually, actually going to be pre-patient zero because that is, that is when he goes from being a cop to a special ops guy, and that's the point where he steps into the weird science world. But there's stuff set right at that point. Um, there's a, a short story in there that's a direct sequel to Patient Zero. It picks up a couple of weeks after Patient Zero where uh, Joe and, and, and some of his guys go hunting for one of the big bad villains from, the first, from that first book. But we also jump around quite a bit, and we, um, we, we see Joe in a lot, of, a lot of different situations, including some situations that are very, very out there on the edge. There's, there's a uh, story that may be a ghost story, depending on how the reader interprets it. Um, there's some hard action. Um, there's some stuff that's that's more political than than uh, like science fiction. -y. So there's a little bit of everything. Joe is is a ubiquitous hero. Hero, I can put him in almost any situation, and something unfortunate is going to happen to people, and that that's a lot of fun. He's kind of a of an X factor, um, and he's he he's a lot of fun to write. He's he's my f personal favorite character to write, um, with Sam Hunter being second, and and the Crow and and and. Uh, Iron Mike Sweeney being the next characters. That group of, of edgy heroes, damaged heroes, are, are, the, are the most fun for me to write. Very cool. Um, to get back to Sam Hunter, uh, the, the approach you took to the werewolf character was really entertaining to me. I, I work as, a, I own a dog daycare in addition to writing, and you yes. really get into the canine psychology uh, that, that's just a an underlying uh, drone for him, you know, he doesn't even have to think about that a lot, but it's, it's in there in a lot of subtle ways. Uh, the, the sense of smell and, and pack mentality. Did your own uh, terrier, um, Rosie, help you with, uh, with the research? Yeah, yes, R R Rosie's been a, a consultant on the project. Uh, but I actually, I grew up with dogs. I grew up with shepherds and mastiffs uh, as a kid. And um, I, uh, I had one dog that was actually a, a mastiff Doberman mix. It was a gigantic dog. and I grew, It was my dog growing up. And you, you learn how smart they are. You learn how each dog is different the way it reacts to, to stimuli and, and relaxes to its, uh, re reacts to its environment. And you really do see, you know, the ones that are going to be an alpha dog and ones that are going to be a pack dog and how they react. Uh, and writers, you know, it's our job to pay attention to this sort of stuff, to take yeah. note of things uh, that we see. But with Sam also, there, there's, you know, there's a bit of the wolf mentality too. I mean, he's, he's he, there's canine, but there's specifically, can, uh, you know, the, the lupus end of that, where, where he is um, the wolf, and I've, I've read a lot about wolf mentality, wolf pack behavior and so on, um, partly because I'm a science geek, and partly because I've written quite a bit about the, the folklore and legends of werewolves, and uh, that does play into it. Um, they, are, they are dogs, or dogs came from wolves, um, and I've always disliked the fact that so many werewolf stories ignore the canine elements when they tell a werewolf story. They just simply focus on teeth and claws. And there's so much more to it. One of the, the books that actually did that really well was um, Wolfen uh, by uh, Whitley Strieber, where it really got into the senses of the animal. That, that, was, that, was a, that book influenced me quite a bit. It, it really adds uh, just, just a, a great physicality and, and a lot of detail to something that's, that's obviously far-fetched. Um, you know, really grounds the, uh, the the character even in his other form. And I noticed that you incorporated some folklore when I when I looked up uh, Thies, the uh, the werewolf of Livonia. I see that that's a historical account uh, where where the local uh, church authorities had a run in with this guy who believed he was truly a werewolf. He seemed to have this shamanistic uh, 
practice where where he would go to try to rescue grain and livestock from the underworld. He said he was was you know on the side of God. Really fascinating stuff. And yeah, that's uh, the legend of the Ben and Dante. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. from from Italy as well. So well, he, Italy, Livonia, uh, parts of Germany, parts of France. It's shown up in a lot of different places. The Ben and Dante, you know, they, these people believed they were werewolves, and that the, at, most of them believed that at night they turned into werewolves and descended into hell to fight monsters. But a lot of them also ranged the countryside to fight monsters. And um, the one guy, Tice, was put on, on trial by the, the Inquisition and tortured for months and months to try to get him to admit that he was, in fact, evil. And they couldn't break him. He kept saying, no, 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 uh, God, we're, we're with God, we're with the good guys. And the Inquisition, not known for its ability, you know, its, its tendency to give up, finally said, well, we can't break you. Um, and you, the only way you could have that kind of power is if you were, in fact, the Hound of God. So they let him go. And it was one of the few times the Inquisition ever ever said, you know, oh my bad, you know. Um, <laughs> nowadays, the Ben and Dante in Italy are mostly they're kind of like Wiccans. They'll come in and bless your house and so on. They don't turn into werewolves, but they do claim descent from these families that go back to Etruscan times. Um, and Sam Hunter is, you know, in a family that has ties to the the, the Ben and Dante, the ancient Ben and Dante. And we find a little bit of more more about that in the second story. We, look, we have some of it in strip search. We'll find more about it in the, in the second story. Really cool. I, I know that you researched a lot of folklore, and you wrote a, a vampire book uh, that wasn't uh, wasn't fiction before the Pine Deep trilogy. Do you still read a lot of folklore? Is that something that you still dig deep into and still are discovering new elements for stories, or is it sort of just the groundwork that you've laid uh, already? No, I've done. I've written six nonfiction books on folklore, um, and uh, one, including one under a pen name. Uh, called the Vampire Slayer's Field Guide to the Undead, written by Shane MacDougall. The pen name thing was a, was a one-off, and I stopped doing pen names after that. But I've I've always had an interest in folklore. My grandmother instilled that in me. Uh, she believed in everything, and she was born in Alsace-Lorraine, which is on the border of France and Germany, of, but of Scottish descent. So I had all those different cultural influences from someone who was born in the, 18, the late 1800s. And she was 40 when my mother was born, and my mother was 40 when I was born. So in 1958, this was an, a woman who had been born in the 1800s, had all that rich history from a time when people believed this. So I've I continue you know my researches. Uh, I have a couple of friends who are folklorists as I am. One of whom actually writes a comic book, uh, Mike Mignola, who does Hellboy. Um, he's probably the most knowledgeable folklorist of all my writer friends. Uh, but I'm you know I'm I'm pretty knowledgeable on the subject myself, and I'm always looking for a new bit of folklore. The main reason I do it. The Hollywood versions, or the, the, the pop culture versions of a lot of the monsters, uh, vampires and werewolves, have been, they're so detached from the original uh, monsters, from the, from the legends, that they no longer bear resemblance to them, and they've become homogenized. I like going back to the older legends because they were usually much scarier and also much more interesting, and now they're uncommon. So they have a sense of freshness that comes from having been forgotten bits of folklore. So that that's that's usually where I, I go when I'm when I'm looking for something for a monster or some horrific element of the story. I actually delve deeper into folklore. Well, it shows that you go back to the source material. Obviously, uh, stories that are only influenced by other contemporary things are just not as rich as as the kind of stuff that you're providing that's in a story thinking. like Strip Search. Um, Another another area where you seem to to get more realistic uh, than than most is in your fight scenes. Um, you're you're as in publishing, you are uh, far more accomplished than myself in martial arts. But um, in, I have a new book coming out where I'm referencing Iaido, the uh, Japanese mm -hmm. sword art, and and trying to take pains with the details of that. I noticed that even in a short novella like uh, Strip Search, you've got a, a scene where Sam uh, he you know he roughs somebody up and and unlike Jack Bauer, uh, we or or James Bond, who you reference, uh, we we don't just expect this guy to wake up later and be fine. You mentioned he's going to be nauseous. He's you tell exactly physiologically what's happening in his yep. spine and how he's going to have back troubles for years to come. Um, how much has your martial arts training and background influenced your writing uh, in in both the particulars of your fiction? But my second part of that question is: uh, has has a martial arts outlook? influenced uh, how you approach the practice of writing uh, at large, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, been, I've been involved in, in traditional jiu-jitsu and kenjutsu, Japanese sword play, for uh, almost 49 years now. Um, wow. it's, it's been something I've, I've done since I was a little kid, 
and it's influenced every part of my life. I mean, certainly the discipline of it, the focus of it, you know, are, are crucial. But I think I, I, I was somewhat fortunate in in the the, the martial art that I actually studied. Uh, was jiu-jitsu, which traditional jiu-jitsu has a kind of a bad rap here. A lot of people think it's just joint locks and so on. Traditional jiu-jitsu was very scientific. You know, it's it's the physics, physio physiology, anatomy, psychology, and and in, in modern cases, the law of combat. You know, it's a science of combat. There are no techniques that a traditional martial artist uses of any any traditional martial art. Um, and I'm not talking about the traditionalists who do competition. I'm talking about the traditional the original combat martial artists, there's nothing they do that wouldn't work because they would die. I mean, they, this was battlefield <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So they had to understand it and they had to pass that along to their friends, family, whatever, so that they could then survive battles. Jiu-Jitsu was invented for when a samurai was, was facing a, another samurai and he didn't have his sword. Pretty much a worst case scenario, you know. Um, so everything's logical. Now that approach to logic, to understanding the why of things, the how, the, the, the nuts and bolts mechanics of it, influenced my writing because everything I write, I, I, you know, I'm a very practical guy. I mentioned earlier I was a science geek. I like to know why and how things work. I also like to know the psychological dynamic of things and that comes from martial arts too because you need to understand your enemy and you absolutely need to understand your own yourself, your, your motivations, what drives you and so on. All of that gets, you know, gets combined into what I write. Um, my fight scenes, uh, even when I'm doing a supernatural fight scene, you know, if, if yeah, like I wrote a, a, a novelization of the Wolfman, we had two different werewolves fighting. Mm -hmm. I, I had to establish what the laws of physics were that applied to these monsters. So what could they and what what could they not do? And then everything was based on that. In Strip Search, you had a guy, you know, he could fight, but also he you know, he had this this monstrous self. How was that character going to fight? Um, the, the the people he, he encountered, what kind of fighters were they going to be. And there's so many little details that you ask yourself in order to build a, a good fight scene. Every, it informs everything I do. Um, you know, martial arts is a, is, is a great ongoing thing for understanding, for keeping a very clear view of what is happening and what's, what each event is likely to mean. So I don't think there's a single part of my creative world that is not influenced by martial arts. And by the way, I also... I teach writing fight and action scenes at writers' conferences across the country. Oh, cool. Well, I hope I get, hope I get to uh, catch you at one of those. That, that would be yeah, they're, really, they're a lot of really fun. Interesting. A little bit of mayhem, but fun. Uh -huh. uh, speaking of, uh, of writing, you know, teaching uh, writing, um, you, you, you mentioned something in a, a recent interview that you did about your character, Joe Ledger, that really caught my eye because it seemed to speak to more than just his character. Uh, it's, it, to me, it seems to say something about horror writers uh, in general, maybe writers in general. You said he's found a careful balance between his damage and his drive. Uh, it really resonated. Um, and I just wanted to ask you in general if you, uh, if you have any advice for, uh, for a horror writer starting out and trying to get a foothold. Well, one of the things that a lot of writers will tell you, and, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of it, is uh, write about the characters, not about the monster. Um, horror for me is never writing about monsters; it's writing about people who oppose monsters. And but there's a step back from that, you know. And Joe Ledger is a good example of that. He fights bad guys because bad things happen to someone he loved, not just because they happened to him. He had a very traumatic childhood, but someone he loved that that he felt he should have been able to protect was destroyed, and he is trying to win that war over and over again. And even he's aware. That it's an unwinnable war. So the, the, the exploration of, of what drives a character to take risks that would essentially make him the, the central character, the protagonist of a story, as opposed to just a character in the story. If you understand what makes that character willing to go the extra mile, then you start with it with a dynamic and interesting character, and then the rest of the story builds around that. A lot of folks make the mistake in horror of starting with the, the horror, the horrific element. And yeah, I mean, if you know your craft, you can build a nice moody scene. But if it isn't about people, and if those people don't matter, and if we don't know a lot about the people, not, I'm not talking about tons of backstory, you can write a scene with a couple of sentences 
and get right to the core of the character, the heart of why that character is afraid, is brave, is, is evil, is good, why they're willing to go into that haunted house, why they're willing to, um, to go to the, the, the castle with a stake and garlic. Um, you know, what makes a person do that when, when ordinarily that would be the last thing somebody would do? Um, at the same time, it helps you understand your villains. It helps you understand the characters in the story who don't succeed. You know, for me, it's all about characters and character motivations. And actually, for writers, I can recommend a superb book on the subject. I'm not a big fan of writing books. Donald Moss, M-A-A-S-S, one of the great literary agents of our time, wrote a book called uh, Writing the Breakout Novel Workbook. Now, he did Writing the Breakout Novel, which is good. But the Writing the Breakout Novel Workbook, the reason I like this so much, it actually makes you answer all the questions that I've always wanted to, to you know, I've always asked myself when writing a book it's all these exercises and myself and a lot of other professional writers I know every time we start a book uh, a new book we get that a new copy of that book and go through and do all the exercises and uh, I, I think I've brought Don, Don Moss a yacht by this point from all the copies I <laughs> well you've sold me on one <laughs> I'm definitely going to check that Great out book. my list when I'm writing everything is, is questions what if this why this you know how about right. that instead um, so to have a structure for that that sounds fantastic uh, so my last question for you, uh, getting back to Strip Search, your Limbus story, uh, the ending is a mind blower. And when I interviewed Anne Petty, the editor of the book, she mentioned that the impetus for the anthology was uh, in part the Twilight Zone yeah. series and, and, uh, and that, that kind of a vibe. And I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal my, my own uh, slight befuddlement here when, when I ask, um, were you aiming for... Uh, an ending that's somewhat open to interpretation at the end to 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 put that kind of a twist on it, um, or is is uh, is it open to something you're going to explore maybe in in the next uh, Sam story that you're doing for? Um, no, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to touch that particular ending uh, again. Though I will reference this story in the next Limbus story, but uh, I wanted it open to interpretation definitely. Um, but I also wrote that before I wrote the rest of the story. I generally go in and write the end of the story first. Um, I want to know how it's going to end, and I want to know what the twist is going to be, and then I can back up and aim at that. Cool. And I wrote that last couple of pages, and uh, those last couple of pages, and I said, wow, that's um, it's not what I expected to write when I, when I plotted out the story, but I wrote it, gave, gave me the sense of, of mood, of, of, of um, weird, and then I sat, you know, and I aimed, you know, started, started at the beginning and aimed at that ending. Um, I don't set out to write a you know a twist. A lot of people try to try that. They try the Twilight Zone twist. I just write the story that I would find most interesting, the one that I would want to then tell someone else about. So I write the story that that really appeals to me as a reader rather than me as a writer. It's kind of an odd thing. But I think a lot of writers probably do that and aren't aware of it. Um, you want to read this story. So you write the story that you really love to read. And at the same time, you know, the reader in you wants to be surprised, but the writer needs to know everything in order to write it. So you find that balance of being entertained by what you're writing and at the same time writing, you know, the best possible story you can while knowing its scope so you can plan foreshadowing and so on. It's an interesting balance. But uh, the Limbus Project gave me the opportunity to, to write a story that had some unusual twist just in the structure. You know, the fact that it's a shared world, this, this shadowy organization that, that hires people. That's a great setup, and it just kind of fires a lot of ideas. And that's why, based on that setup, I, I wrote that ending and said, okay, this person works for Limbus. How weird is that? Well, who, right. who the heck are these guys that this person works for them? Right. You know? um, and, and, and you... you 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 right. mentioned that when you plotted, excuse me, when you plotted the story, you didn't necessarily know that that twist would be in there, and yet you can write in a nonlinear way. I, I spoke to Joseph Nassis about this too. Uh, maybe writing an ending and then and then backing up and writing toward that. So even though you might plot in advance, do you discover things about the story in the process of writing that scene that might be a revelation to you? Always. Um... Uh, you know, I am a structure guy. I was trained as a journalist, not a creative writer. So I'm a structure guy. I like I like knowing where the whole thing is going. And, and once that's written, I don't write in a linear fashion because uh, sometimes I might be in the mood to write a certain type of scene at a given time. So I'll go ahead and jump and do that, and I'll plug it into the, the plot and keep going. Okay. But you can't possibly have all your best ideas the day you plot out your story. 
That's impossible. So you have to allow for organic growth. One, one example of that, there's a scene in the story where he goes to a, an apartment uh, owned by a friend of the girl he's looking for. That whole scene wasn't in the original plot. I mean, it was supposed to be two, uh, like half a page. But when I got there, I got into you know the tragedy of that character and what that character's life might mean, um, and you know the impact of that life in the story. Because too often in mystery stories, you, when you have a body count where the, 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 the protagonist is constantly finding more dead bodies, you tend to lose the human connection to each of those other victims, and I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So when I got to that scene, I allowed myself to deviate from my plot to linger and explore the tragedy of that scene. And I think it deepened the story. It certainly deepened it for me as a writer. And I, I, I've heard from readers that it really, uh, really mattered to them. It's a powerful scene. And, uh, and the ending really does put a chill down the spine. I, I won't uh, say any more about that so people can enjoy discovering it for themselves. Uh, so Limbus, Inc., the Shared World Anthology from Journal Stone featuring Strip Search by Jonathan Mabry. Thanks so much for talking with me about it today, Jonathan. It's such a small portion of, of the many stories that you have in progress, and, uh, and I look forward to, to following more from, uh, from Sam Hunter, the, the werewolf I, PI. I, I just want to throw one last thing in there. There's a signed numbered limited edition of Limbus that's out, that's available. In that, it has the original, the first uh, Sam Hunter story as well. It's a bonus story. Oh, cool. It's only in the, the hardcover edition. And that's a story that introduces Sam. Excellent. Um, so that's that's it, a leather, leather-bound hardcover, right? Yes, yeah, leather-bound hardcover. And it has that, that additional light part of the family story that a lot of my readers have, have told me is, you know, that and Strip Search are their favorite stories of anything, I've, uh, short stories of anything I've written. So we decided to include them both in the hardbound edition. So it, it, it is, a, it is a, a fun bonus for people and... and uh, you know, it, it, it's a little something actually they weren't expecting for that, that edition. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. That makes a, a great book even better. I hope people will pick that up. Thanks again, Jonathan. Have a great afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you.